Good evening. Uh, welcome to our Good Friday service. Uh, this is unprecedented. Um, never done anything in my whole life as a believer in the Lord Jesus virtual, but I pray that you've joined us tonight. As Lisa was playing and I was praying and meditating for the service tonight, the Lord drew me to a, a statement that Jesus had made. And that was, he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And so my prayer tonight as you join us for this service is that as Jesus is lifted up, as we focus on his cross and the glory of the cross for us, that we would be drawn by the Holy Spirit of God to him. Would you join me in prayer as we begin tonight? Father, we thank you for this unusual opportunity to celebrate Good Friday. And Lord, as I was reflecting earlier about what would make it Good Friday, because it was so horrific for our Savior, for your Son, for our Messiah, what would make it good is that what would come from it. Lord, we celebrate tonight as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Good Friday, that Jesus would be lifted up in this service tonight and that even those who do not know you would be drawn unto you by the Holy Spirit of God, that they might believe. And for those of us who have believed already, we might be drawn closer to you, that we might gain a deeper appreciation for what you've done for us, that we might celebrate and give you the glory that you deserve through this incredible act. Lord, lead us and guide us by your spirit in this service. Anoint the music, anoint the message, anoint the reading of scripture, Lord, that it would all glorify you and point to you, the one and only Savior of the world. We ask this in Jesus' precious name by the power of his spirit. Amen. As we begin tonight, I want to start with a couple of scriptures from the Old Testament uh, I've been reading recently about Jesus being the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures, and I've drawn a deeper appreciation um, for that. And so as I read tonight from Isaiah 53, 3 through 6, and Psalm 22, 1 through 18, would you hear God's word as it points us to the cross? In Isaiah 53, the prophet says this, He was despised and forsaken of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities the chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And we see a prediction and a prophecy and a foreshadowing of the cross, the event of the cross in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy, O oh, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted you and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. Yet you, yet you are he who brought me from, forth from the womb. You made me trust when my, upon my mother's breasts. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. 
Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is no one to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They have opened wide their mouth at me as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of the earth. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers have encompassed me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. They look. They stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And my clothing they cast lots. Brothers and sisters, all of this prophetically came true. As David prophesied by the Holy Spirit about the effects of Jesus that would have experienced on the cross. May this bring us to a deeper awe of what he did for us. Would you join the worship team as we sing together the, the song, The Old Rugged Cross.
unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is near. I am to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. Now when the evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with his 12 disciples. As they were eating, he said, Truly, I say to you, that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, they each began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. And he answered, He who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. We are now going to participate in what we call communion. Now we as Baptists, uh, part of our distinctive as Baptists is that we believe in the ordinances of the Lord's Supper uh, as well as baptism. So we're going to participate in what we call the Lord's Supper or communion tonight. But as I just read the, the scripture, it wasn't communion that they were celebrating. It was Passover. Passover, uh, back in the book of Exodus, was a meal, a memorial meal that Israel was to celebrate perpetually uh, till the end of time as a remembrance of what God had done for them through Moses as he delivered the children of Israel from Pharaoh and from Egypt. As they're partaking of this meal, there would have been four cups that they would have drunk from that night. And, and, and something that struck me a few years ago uh, when I was teaching Bible class, um, I did some research around this and I discovered that these young men, the men that would have been following Jesus that were having this Passover with him, uh, this would have been the first time they would have celebrated the Passover without their family. Jesus had become their family. So he was going to celebrate his final Passover with them. And as they're partaking of this, uh, when we get to the cup portion, you'll recognize that it was the third cup, the cup of redemption. So join with me in Scripture in 26 through 29 as we get ready to participate in this new covenant meal. Continuing on in the story, it says, While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing it, he broke it. So he took this, what was considered matzah, flat bread. And the reason why they had flat bread uh, is because they were to eat the Passover in haste. They didn't have time for the, the bread to rise. So it says he took it, and after, he, after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come and celebrate the, the renewed Passover meal, the Passover meal that would point not just to deliverance from Israel or from Egypt, but Lord, it would be the ultimate deliverance. As Moses delivered the people of Israel out of slavery, out of bondage, as, as the death angel would have passed over that night, Lord, as they ate the lamb, it would have reminded them of what you had done for them in their deliverance. Tonight, as we participate in the bread, Lord, may it be a reminder of the Lamb of God, the broken Lamb of God that died for us in our place, that was beaten beyond recognition, Lord. May we take this bread right now as a reminder of the Lamb that was slain and the broken bones that would have been uh, what would have been broke how he would have been broken on our behalf lord may we participate now and bring honor and glory to your name as we reflect in memorial for what jesus has done for us lord we ask these things in jesus name amen so i'm going to invite you if you have your the elements with you right now 
I'm going to invite you to participate by taking this bread. And, and I'm going to ask that you not take it lightly. That even though this is just a piece of flat bread or, or a bread that you might have around the house, tonight it's being sanctified and consecrated as something special. Not just a, a particular loaf of bread, but a piece of bread that reminds us of the lamb that was slain for us. So take now in remembrance of Jesus. And give thanks as Jesus gave thanks. Don't forget to say thank you to Jesus for his willingness to have his body broken for us. This was going to be a picture of that lamb that we will see on the, on the cross, the broken body of the lamb on the cross. And it would have been, these guys wouldn't have understood the foreshadowing yet, but they would have understood the deliverance that was about to come. And then, continuing on, it says, and when he had taken a cup and given thanks. So he took a cup. Again, that cup would have been the third cup, the cup of redemption. And it's the cup that earlier, two of his disciples said, well, we'll drink of it. And he said, you can't drink this cup. The cup I'm going to drink, the cup of redemption, is the cup of wrath that would be poured out on the Messiah. Nobody else could take that. Only he could take that cup, that cup that would bring about redemption. It says he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant. And he's referring here to the second covenant, not to the first, but the second covenant. Even the first covenant, which was inaugurated in blood. If you go back to the book of Exodus, you see that it was inaugurated in blood. Jesus now is going to inaugurate this new covenant in his blood because the scripture tells us in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. He says, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Would you join me again in prayer? Lord, we thank you that this cup that Jesus would have been passing around to his disciples, this cup of uh, redemption, Lord, would be a picture of the cup that he would take, the wrath of God upon himself, that he would, through the shedding of his blood, he would redeem us from our sins by faith. So Father, right now as we partake of it, may we take of it in a reverent and holy and yet celebratory way to thank Jesus for shedding his blood, his life blood on our behalf, that he would die that we might have life. Remind us of the significance of it tonight once more, Lord as we give you the praise and worship that you deserve as we partake of this. And we ask it in Yeshua Mashiach's name. So take the cup that you have in front of you and partake of it as they would have, as a symbol, as a memorial of what Christ has done for us. Take it and give him thanks right now. He goes on to say in verse 29, But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it with new, new in my Father's kingdom. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we did not have the privilege of being with Jesus and celebrating the Passover meal and the inauguration of the new covenant. But I believe as New Testament believers who've entered into this covenant by faith in Jesus Christ's death alone, that one day we will partake of this anew in the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to be able to partake of this with the one who took my sins on, his, on my behalf. Would you continue reading with me, picking up in verse 30 in Matthew? 
It says, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you that this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing too. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watch and praying that you will not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Would you join me for prayer? Lord, we thank you that Jesus prayed in that garden of Gethsemane, that, that place called Gethsemane, which means the oil press. Lord, we believe it's significant that he was in that place praying, seeking you. Lord, in his flesh, asking if there was any other way to bring about the salvation of the world. And yet he was willing to submit to your will. Lord, we thank you that he depended upon you in his final hours as he did his entire ministry, Lord. Father, wait, may we too depend on you. And may we recognize in prayer tonight and give you thanks tonight that Jesus was willing to go to the cross. And that, Lord, he even began to suffer in the, the garden of oil press. As his soul was being afflicted by grief, Lord, in what he was about to do. And yet he was willing to submit to your will. And Lord, your word tells us in Hebrews chapter 12 that he went to the cross, enduring the shame for the joy set before him. Lord, knowing that he was doing your will, knowing that he would benefit us one day, that through his death and your acceptance of it, Lord, we would receive the benefit of that salvation, Lord. Father, as we reflect in prayer, may we be ever grateful, ever praising you for what you've done on our behalf, Lord. Tonight, as a body of Christ virtually, we give you thanks. We thank you that Jesus had opportunity after opportunity to not go to the cross and yet to be obedient to you, knowing the outcome for us, he went. May we give thanks to you tonight, Lord. And we ask it in the precious and powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Continuing on with the story in Matthew 27. By the way, I'm jumping over uh, the, the denial of Peter. But let me just say this as I turn to Matthew 27, uh, starting in 47. Um, what, what goes on? Um, 
is the scripture tells us that as Jesus is passing by Peter, he has eye contact with him. Can you imagine what it would have been like for Peter who claimed he would never deny him that the moment he denied him, he said he, he locked eyes with Jesus and began to weep. Um, Peter was truly affected by that. As we continue on in Matthew 27 and, and telling the story, um, continuing on, um, we read, let's start in verse 45. It says, now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Does that sound familiar from Psalm 22? And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, began saying, this man is calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yelled uh, and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints had fallen asleep or raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him kept keeping guard over Jesus when they had heard the earthquake and the things that were happening became very frightened and said, truly, this was the Son of God. Would you join us again as we sing um, this beautiful song, The Wonderful Cross.
realized that I had gotten us a little out of order. Um, so I want to just take us back for a minute because I want us to see um, what Jesus went through before he arrived at the cross. If you've done, ever done any study on the crucifixion, you realize that the Jews would have broken their own laws that night as they had these overnight um, trials against Jesus. They would have broken the law six times. There were six um, irregular trials, as it were. And I want us to, to go back to Matthew uh, 20, it should be 26, um, 47 through 68. So after he's praying in the garden and they, they come to get him, it says, while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up and accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs who came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he was betraying him, gave him a sign saying, whoever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately Judas went to Jesus and said, hail rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, friend, do what you've come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who was with Jesus reached and drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place, for all who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I cannot appeal to my father? He at once will put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. How then will the scripture be fulfilled, which say that it must happen this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. Then all the disciples left and fled. Those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. But Peter was following, so he's following at a distance. Verse 59, now the chief priest and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus, so they might put him to death. They did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. But later on, two came forward and said, The man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Do you want not want to answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you now have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists, and others slapped him. And they said, prophesy to us, you Christ who are the one who hit you. And then going over to Luke chapter 23, we see Jesus is now going to be brought before Pilate on trial. Then, G, then the whole body of, of them got up and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered to him and said, It is as you say. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they kept on insisting, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee, even as far as this place. When Pilate heard him, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was in Jerusalem at that time. Now Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus, for he had wanted to see him for a very long time because he had been hearing about him and hoping to see him perform some sign. And he questioned him at some length, but he answered him nothing. 
And the chief priests and the scribes were standing there accusing him vehemently. And Herod with the soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. Now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that very day, for before they had been enemies with each other. Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said to them, You brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, I have examined him before you. I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. Let me just add a little something to this verse right here. Historically, at the time that Pilate would have inspected him and made this statement was the very moment that the chief priests were, were investigating the lamb that was to be slaughtered for Passover to find that lamb to be innocent. Isn't it interesting that in God's sovereignty, Pilate, of all people, would make this statement that I have inspected him and I've declared him innocent. No, nor has Herod, for he sent him back to us, and behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Therefore, I will punish and release him. Now, he was obliged to release to them at, at the feast one prisoner. But they cried out all together, saying, Away with this man and release for us Barabbas. He was one who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection made in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept calling out, saying, Crucify, crucify him. And he said to them the third time, Why, what evil has this man done? I have found in him no guilt demanding death. Therefore, I will punish and release him. But they insisted with loud voices, asking that he be crucified, and their voices began to prevail. And Pilate pronounced the sentence that their demand be granted. And he released the man they were asking for who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. But he delivered Jesus to their will. Over in the Gospel of John, um, chapter 19, we see the account of Christ's crucifixion. In John 19, uh, beginning in verse 16, it says they handed him over to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, and went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two other men on one side and one the other, and Jesus in between, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What is written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified him, they took out his outer garments and made four parts a part to every soldier, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus was his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed up his head and gave up his spirit. As we come to the message for tonight, I want to take us back really quickly to John 10. Because if you look at the story and you don't understand who Jesus is, 
you begin to think he's some helpless victim. That he was a pawn in God's plan and that he had nothing to say about this. But earlier as he was teaching in John 10, he says this in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then in verse 14, he says again, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. I share that to say that Jesus was not a helpless victim. Jesus was in full control at the cross, When he did what he did, albeit he did it in obedience to the Father, he did it of his own free will. What I want to share with us tonight as I get ready to follow, to to finish up this series that I've been doing entitled His Gain, Our Pain, we come to the portion from Good Friday that relates to what I've been talking about. Let me just quickly recap the gain that we receive by putting faith and trust in Christ's work on the cross. We looked the first week at being released from the penalty of sin. We're pardoned, we're declared innocent, we're set free by faith in Jesus Christ. And then in week two, we looked at the idea of not only being set free and declared innocent, but we need to now be reckoned righteous before God through, through what Christ did for us. Then we look at the fact that we were rescued in week three and then reconciled back to God. We were rescued from his wrath and we were set at peace once again in a right relationship with God. And then in week four, we talked about being redeemed and being set free from the bondage of sin, Satan, and even the law. And I'm here to share tonight in this Good Friday celebration that we can realize and receive and become recipients of all that Christ did for us by faith. And I'll just share this. Christ died for all. But Christ's death was only going to become effective for those who would receive it by faith. So if you're watching tonight and thinking in your theology that Jesus died for me, and it's universal, and I don't have to do anything, and I'm going to be okay with God one day. I'm here to tell you your theology is wrong. This, what Christ did for us, the gain that we can have from that needs to be received by faith. The finished work on the cross makes this possible. Let me share with you tonight, briefly, four things about Realizing, receiving, and becoming recipients by faith. First of all, the payment that was accomplished. In John 4, 34, Jesus says this to his disciples in the context of them coming back while he was ministering to the Samaritan woman. In 4, 34, he's talking to them about the harvest, and he's talking to them about food, and Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So the question is, what was the work that came, that Jesus came to accomplish that he was talking to the disciples about? Well, yes, it's it's the work on the cross, but it's something even before that. As I was reflecting on this verse today, God showed me the work that Jesus was talking about. It's twofold. His work is to show the way to salvation. We see that in John 1.18 and John 17.3, where John 17.3 in his high priestly prayer uh, in the garden, 
He prays that they might know what true life is. That true life is found in believing in the Father and the one that he sent. And I believe that would include the work of the cross. So we see that the work that God had sent him to do on his behalf was first of all to show the way and then ultimately become the way back to God, to salvation. Matthew 27, uh, 51 says this about that, that he would become the way uh, for us. And I read it earlier. When Jesus had given up his spirit to God, when he had died on the cross, it says, And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. That wasn't put in there just for some cute little commentary. John, or, or Matthew, wrote that theologically to say that the temple, which was the temple, the, the uh, curtain that was in the, the, the veil, the veil that was in the, the temple, which would have been like three feet thick, Right? at the moment that Jesus died, was split from top to bottom, indicating that Christ's death had opened up the way for a way of man to reach out to, to God, to, go, to get back to God. We see John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. The way he's talking about is the way of salvation. Another verse that you can write down, Acts 4.12 says, there's no name given under heaven by which men must be saved. Jesus is the only way. And then finally, in Hebrews 10.20, the writer of Hebrews tells this to us about the idea of Jesus becoming that way. In verse 19, it says, therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Jesus made a way. So the, the work that he came to do on behalf of God and to accomplish was first of all to show us the way and then to make the way back to God as we've seen in these scriptures. And in John 19, 30, when he says, it is finished, that's the English translation. Three words to make up one phrase in Greek, which is tetelestai. The word tetelestai is translated, it is finished. What was finished? The work of the cross. The work that he had come to do was finished. And it's interesting because in that day, if you were to borrow money from somebody, you were to borrow money, you were to sign a paper. You were to say, I owe Jim this much money. And you would pay the debt off a little at a time. And when the debt was finally paid off, the contract, across the contract, was written to Telestai, and then it was nailed to the door of the person whose debt it was. What Jesus is saying is, I came to pay the debt. I came to accomplish the debt on your behalf, and it is finished. It is accomplished. In Isaiah 53, Five, going back to the beautiful book of Isaiah. In Isaiah 53, 5, it says, But he was crushed through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. By his scourging we are healed. What it's talking about there is the idea that our well-being or our shalom, our peace would come with God because of what Christ had done for us. And by his scourging, we are healed. What he means there, he's not talking about we can claim healing, physical healing in the name of Jesus. What he's talking about there is that we are healed from the disease of sin in context. And then in verse 10, it says, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. God the Father was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he would see his offspring, he would prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. What good pleasure could have come from, from God crushing his son and from the son being crushed by the father on the cross? What good? The good pleasure, the offspring that would come. That would be you and me, brothers and sisters. That would be us by faith 
in Jesus Christ. And then I, I, I shared this earlier, Hebrews 12, 2. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. Well, what joy could Jesus have possibly had except that he was looking forward and he was looking to us. He was looking at those that would trust him alone for salvation. And what Jesus said is it's finished. All of that, it's accomplished. But like I said earlier, for it to mean anything for us, it has, the payment has to be accepted. It has to be appropriated on our behalf or, or, or by God. It has to be accepted by God first before we can be saved. So in Romans 3, in verses 24 through 26, it says this. Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. What he's saying there is as Jesus was publicly, publicly displayed for our payment of our debt and our sin, and when God saw what he had done and he had said to Telestai, the work is accomplished, God was willing to accept that payment on our behalf because Jesus had, by this being the sinless Lamb of God, had paid the penalty that God would accept on our behalf. Are you, are you grateful, brothers and sisters, that he did this for us and that we don't have to go through what Jesus went through to find right standing with God. It was accepted on our behalf because listen to what it goes on to say in 25. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. Well, what, what is that saying? What it's saying is this, brothers and sisters. What it's saying is that every time they sprinkled blood on the altar, back in the Old Testament, to cover the sins, it didn't cover them it, it covered them, but it didn't take them away. And so what he's saying is that in Christ, he takes all the sins that were ever paid for by the blood of bulls and goats, and he takes them by faith and lays them on Jesus. So that Jesus, in verse 26, that God would be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. And then in 425, listen to what it says about God accepting the sacrifice for us because of Jesus. It says, but for our sake, he also whom to be credited those who believed in him who raised Jesus from the dead. He was delivered over, verse 25, because of our transgressions and raised because of our justification. Yes, the payment was accepted impartial on the cross, but it was when Jesus raises from the dead that God completely completes the transaction and has accepted once and for all. Hebrews 2.17, I'm not even going to go there. 1 John 2.2 2 and 4.10 talks about Jesus being the propitiation on our behalf. And so not only did Jesus accomplish the work on the cross, but then God accepted it. But here's where it has to be appropriated and applied by faith. The payment needs to be applied. Because if Jesus died for the sins of the world and it's not appropriated, it's not applied by faith, then you're still walking dead. It's only those that, who've accepted it by faith who can say that work has been done for them. In Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, this beautiful verse, which I'm sure most could quote um, without even having being read, it says, For by grace you've been saved. Through faith. Grace you've been saved through faith. Because of his work and our faith in his work, we have been saved and not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that nobody may boast. You and I are saved alone by Jesus accomplishing the payment that he needed to make on our behalf. By God accepting it on our behalf because he was the sinless lamb of God. And then by it being applied to us. So in the same way, in the same way, back in Exodus, that he told them, look, I'm going to deliver you from the Egyptians. If they didn't put that blood over the doorpost, they would have been struck down. In the same way, the blood needs to be applied today in our lives by faith through grace. 
and then we can know we are in right standing before God. But then, not only does it need to be appropriated, but I believe the payment needs to be acted on. You can't just walk away and go, I'm saved, thank you Jesus, and then do what? Nothing? No, I don't believe the scripture allows for that. Galatians 2.20. Listen to what Paul declares that we can claim as New Testament believers today. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. And we're going to look at that next Sunday. The idea of being united with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Brothers and sisters, if we really truly have applied this transaction on our behalf by faith, then we're going to live it out. We're going to live for the Son of God who died in our place. And then in 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter says something about how we're to live in light of this incredible salvation. Peter says, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. You say, what's he talking about there? Well, if you understand and interpret this verse properly, Christ suffered in the flesh for what reason? One reason only is to put an end to sin. He didn't come for any other reason. He didn't need to die on his own behalf. He died on our behalf to get rid of sin in our lives. Once and for all. And he goes on to say in verse 2, So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. So if you have appropriated by faith this incredible work on the cross that was accomplished by Jesus and was accepted by God, then brothers and sisters, my challenge from the scripture is to go and act on it. Go act and live as though you really have applied it to your life by faith. I'm going to end this message tonight with with this scripture. In Matthew 5.1, if you have not trusted Christ alone for salvation, we need to recognize our need of Jesus and repent of our sins in order to appropriate and participate in his gain for us. So you might be saying tonight, well, this is all nice. It's beautiful that Jesus died on the cross, but I'm really not that bad. And, and you know, I, I think I'll be okay and right before God one day. I'm here to warn you. Your theology is wrong based on Scripture. And you will not stand okay before God one day. So I'm here to warn you that like all of us who trusted Christ for salvation, this is what you need to understand from Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Or or, actually in 5, verse uh, 3. As he began to teach the crowds, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What's Jesus talking about? Blessed are the poor, how? Not physically, but poor in spirit. And what he's saying here is, is that in in all essence he's saying is you need to recognize your need of me. You need to recognize your need for salvation. That you can't come before God except by being a poor and wretched beggar spiritually and understanding that it's only by reaching out for God's mercy and grace and hoping that he gives it to you and praying that he gives it to you that you can truly know Christ. The night If you haven't done that, I beg of you, please, may tonight be your night of salvation. For those who have, would you understand that just because we've received Christ doesn't mean that we're not still have to be poor in spirit, that we are not to continually come before God and to say it's only through the finished work of Christ that I can come and stand before you. Lord, we thank you as we sing this final song. Thank you. We come as beggars, knowing we have nothing to offer the God of this universe, the King of the universe. We have nothing to offer you but our sin. But Lord, we're willing to exchange it with your righteousness, Jesus. Realizing that 
Only you can give us what we need. Thank you for your finished work on the cross. Thank you, Lord, for accepting it on our behalf and by faith. Lord, we know we have been forgiven. Lord, may we live in light of the power of the cross. And for that, we give you thanks. And we ask that you be glorified in it.
Can you say amen to that church? Wasn't that beautiful? The power of the cross. Hear the scripture in John 19, starting in verse 31. Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may also believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill Scripture. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another Scripture says, they shall look on him whom they've pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds of weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices as the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb, which no one had ever been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for this time that we could gather together virtually tonight that we could reflect on the incredibleness of the cross on our behalf. Lord, as we think of them laying his body in the tomb, Father, we can only imagine how the disciples must have, must have felt. How grieved they were, Lord, to wonder what had happened to the Messiah. And Lord, since they didn't truly understand yet the resurrection, they would have been in grieving. They would have been hiding in fear. And so Lord, would you allow us to use this day and tomorrow as we prepare for the resurrection celebration to reflect on all that you've done on our behalf. Lord, as we participated in the Lord's Supper tonight as a reminder, as a memorial that we would not forget yeah, and that we would again proclaim your death until you come again. As we reflect on all that we've heard tonight, may we not soon forget what you've done for us. Lord, we look forward to symbolically celebrating the resurrection that's already taken place. But Lord, may we reflect in the meantime as we get ready to gather again in two days. Lord, we thank you and praise you for our great salvation. We give you the glory that you alone deserve. And we ask it in Jesus' name, by the power of the Spirit. I invite you to join us virtually on Sunday morning for the resurrection celebration. We'll be going live on Facebook at 10 o'clock. God bless you in between time. God bless you as you reflect on his death on your behalf.